your Bibles this morning uh, will be our text. We're going we're gonna to look at Luke chapter 2 together in verses 1 through uh, 20, but we're really going, I'm going to read all of that, but we're going to really kind of zero in on verses 15 through 20 and kind of examining uh, this group of shepherds. It's always a challenge uh, for me. Some guys really thrive in this. I don't. It's always a challenge for me uh, to preach special days. What do you mean by that? I'm talking like Christmas, Easter, uh, those kinds of days whenever uh, we're trying to take this, this you, you, I mean, you don't have all these different texts. You have kind of this central focus here, and, and you're trying to come up with a, a creative way to do this. And, and as, as I looked at that this last week, it's, it's, God just kind of, He knows what you need when you need. 
uh, and just really settled my heart on the fact that I don't think it's so necessary that we come up with something out of the box, new creative way to, to, to share something that is just a bedrock truth in our life. What a magnificent story we have in, in knowing that God loved us so much that he sent his son. Amen? And so I want to look at this with you today. If you would, stand with me to honor the reading of uh, our Scripture. And we're going to begin reading in verse 1 of Luke chapter 2. If you found your place there, say amen. The Bible says in Luke chapter 2, verse 1, And it came to pass in those days that a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that all of the world should be registered. This census first took place while Quirinius was governing Syria. So all went to be registered, everyone to his own city. Joseph also went up from Galilee out of the city of Nazareth into Judea to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David, to be registered there with Mary, his betrothed wife, who was with child. And so it was that while they were there, the days were completed for her to be delivered. And she brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling uh, cloths and laid him in the manger because there was no room for them in the inn. Pause for a second. Out of all of history, if there was a guy that said, I would sure like to have a do-over, don't you think that innkeeper would have said, y'all can stay here? I just think of stuff like that. Verse 8. Now there were in the same country shepherds living out in the fields, keeping watch over their flock by night. And behold, an angel of the Lord stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were greatly afraid. And the angel said to them, Do not be afraid, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which will be to all people. For there is born to you in this, this day in the city of David a Savior who is, born, who is Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign to you. You will find a babe wrapped in swaddling cloths lying in a manger. And suddenly, and suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of heavenly hosts praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. If there was ever a time to have an iPhone out filming, would that not have been a moment? Amen? My goodness, can you imagine? You ever just kind of take your mind and let yourself go back to that moment of what that must have been like? I, I, certainly, I think there would be that fear because that's how angels always show up. Angels never show up and go, yo. They never show up and say, what's up? They, they, they're always saying, fear not. Why? Because it's a little bit freaky, Okay? And then now all of this multitude of angels are singing together the glory of God, praising God, glory to God in the highest, and on earth goodwill towards men. Verse 15 says, And so it was when the angels had gone away from them into heaven that the shepherds said to one another, Let us go now to Bethlehem and see this thing which has come to pass, which the Lord has made known to us. And they came with haste, and they found Mary and Joseph and the babe lying in a manger. And now when they had seen him, they made widely known the saying which was told them concerning this child. And all those things, or all those who had heard it, marveled at those things which were told them by the shepherds. But Mary, in verse 19, it says, kept all these things and pondered them in her heart. And then the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all the things that they had heard and seen and as it was told them before we pray I want to can I ask a favor of you this morning um, I was thinking about this this week I, I don't know my story will be different from some of you some of you will be very similar but I don't know in all of my life that I've ever missed ever that I've ever missed a Christmas Sunday service I'm uh, older than some of you. I'm way, way younger than some of you. But I, I, in all of my life, Gary, I don't think I've ever missed a Christmas Sunday. This is what this is. And as a result of that, I've heard this story of Luke chapter 2, the babe lying in a manger, 
now hundreds, I'm not hundreds of years old, okay? I know what I just set myself up for, but I've heard it hundreds and hundreds of times. I've preached on it dozens and dozens and dozens of times. Here's what I'm guilty of, and I don't want you to be today, hearing it just as another story, seeing it as just another Sunday, Christmas Sunday, where pretty little girls have their nice little pretty Christmas dresses, and they spin around, and and even some of the guys took a bath before they came today. It's a special day. I want to ask you to just take a moment as we pray to maybe make this commitment to the Lord. If you have something new, fresh, life-changing to say to me today, I want to receive it. Not only just want to hear it, because God's always speaking, we know that. But I want, to, I want to receive it. I want it to be mine. I want to ask you this. Do you think it's possible that God, holy God, would have something specific for you today. If you believe that, as we pray, would you just ask him to speak, make a commitment that I'll respond however you have me to respond in this very moment. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for the Christmas story. Thank you that it's more than just a story. It's, it's more than green eggs and ham. It's not just a, a children's fable, but Lord, it's a life-altering and eternity-changing uh, story because it tells of the love of God for a fallen man. It tells of the commitment of a holy God to send His perfect Son to come to this earth. And Father, we want to pause this morning and tell you that we are thankful, that we are grateful you are a good God to us, and we, we're overwhelmed by that goodness. I pray today that, Lord, that you would use this very story, use this very preacher to proclaim that story in such a way today that we'd hear a personal word for us, for each one. Those that are here, those that are maybe watching online with live streaming, that you'd speak into our hearts and that, Lord, even before we hear the message, we'd be willing to say, yes, Lord, I will. We bless you and pray you bless the reading of your word. For it's in Christ's name we pray, amen and amen. You may be seated. As I indicated earlier this morning, I want to speak to you on this subject, going home for Christmas. One of the things that we love so much about Christmas is this nostalgic idea of going home for Christmas. There are so many um, traditions and things of that nature that accompany it, maybe more than any other holiday uh, that we have in our calendar year. I mean, think about all of the things that go on with Christmas. There are uh, traditions that you grew up with, traditions now that you young parents are, are starting with your kids, uh, th some things that you've done all of your life, and some maybe for the first time this year, you started a brand new uh, tradition. Uh, and, and here's the thing, when it comes to Christmas, Christmas traditions, y'all have some nutty ones, right? Raise your hand if you've got a goofy Christmas tradition in your family. About three of you, or some of you lying in the house of God. We've got some nutty Christmas traditions. And, and, and I grew up, here was my Christmas tradition. I couldn't, well, Christmas Eve was our big night, right? And I couldn't wait for Christmas Eve. That was the fun night. I went over to my, my, my grandma and, and grandpa's. We called her uh, Sheen. Her name was Shirlene, and we called her Sheen. Okay, uh, her middle name was Flossie, and if she knew that I told you that right now, she'd roll over in her grave. She, so we'd say Flossie once in a while. We went to Sheen and Pops. That's where we went to on Christmas Eve, and we did what every good Christian would do. We ate Sloppy Joes. Hallelujah. That's just what you ate on Christmas Eve. That was what it was. And, and so when we got done with our Sloppy Joes, you could see from the, the dining room into the living room, because under the living room was this little bitty tree. She never had a big tree. It was always one of those little miniature, like, something like you'd see probably at a smoke shop window somewhere. And, and I, I think that's probably where she got it. And, and, and she had that in there. But she had presents galore, man, I'm telling you. And so we couldn't really, to be honest with you, enjoy our sloppy joes. Why? Because my brother and I could not wait to get in there. Well, something happened also as a part of our tradition. Whenever you got done, um, the next thing was not presents for us. Why? Because we had to wait for them to do what they called settle our dinner. 
Anybody know what that means? They said, no, hang on, you got to wait for the dinner to settle. So what that meant for them was you always turned your chair sideways from the table, light a cigarette, and then you'd smoke. And that somehow settled your dinner uh, while we were sitting there, uh, you know, enjoying their secondhand smoke, waiting to go open our presents. We had a pretty jacked up life. I didn't know it until I got older and, you know, counselor told me. But that was what we did. And so we would sit there and we'd eat tater candy and we'd eat all kinds of other stuff that was probably, that I'm now told is bad for me. And we couldn't wait to get in there and do that. And then we would, when we get done, then we had some more family up in, uh, this was in Cassville, Missouri. You can get your map out. I'm sure you all will later. We had to go to a place called Aurora, Missouri, which is about another hour away. And it was always so cold, but we all had to cram into this one car with Sheen and Pop. And they, they were smoking. I mean, they were like two fists and cigarettes all the way up there, but it was cold, and, and, and Pop wouldn't roll down his window. I hated going to Aurora because when we got in the backseat of that car, and it's just so, I mean, I don't know how he saw to drive. So much smoke filled it. That's probably why I can't breathe today. And that was Christmas. Now, when you think about Christmas, you, you have your own stories, right? You have your things that you do and things that you used to do and things that you're starting to do now. But when I talk about going home for Christmas this morning, I want to kind of change the, I want to kind of change the discussion a little bit, and I don't want you to think so much about going home to that, <laughs> smoking cigarettes and eating tater candy. I want to kind of talk about what is really a picture of that eternal home that we have. Because here's what I found out about those Christmas traditions: believe it or not, they change. You don't want them to, and we love that whole nostalgic thing of, of nothing ever changing, but whenever Chastity and I first got married and we blended those families, some of you young families are just now figuring all that out, we, we didn't really spend Christmas anywhere except for in our car because we had about 30 different Christmas. I mean, we, we, we couldn't stay anywhere. So there, Most of them we didn't take our coats off. Some of them we didn't turn the car off. You showed up, went in, ate something, got back in the car, and, man, we're going across town or across the state going to another one. And that's what you did. Well, guess what? We don't have all that anymore. Why? People got old and died. That's why. And it changes. It, it, we don't have so many of them now. It's slowed down now. So why are you saying all that? Here's why. The, there's some things in our life that we need to understand won't ever change. Because all that stuff, it, it shifts, right? From year to year, it's a little bit different. And my mom has tried to recreate the whole, she doesn't smoke, but she's tried to make sloppy joes. And she can't make them like Sheen did. We try to recreate that, but we can't completely. Well, where are you going, preacher? I'm going with this. I want to submit to you this morning, there's, there's a way we can go home for Christmas that will never change for us ever in our life, for even for all of eternity, of understanding that the, the, the old saying goes that this world is not my home. I'm just, y'all remember that song? I, if I could sing like Steve, I'd break out. This world's not my home. I'm just passing through. My treasures are laid up somewhere beyond the thank you. What does all that mean? What that means is that Christ says that I am your home. I, I'm, I'm a picture of, of what never changes in your life. That's what was so mesmerizing about these shepherds that night. The shepherds weren't all that mesmerized by saying, man, next year, let's eat sloppy joes out while we're with the sheep, okay? Because that'll be great. Who's bringing the cigarettes? They did it. But what changed their life that night was Jesus. What changed their life that night was what entered there uh, in the form of a baby. So I want to give you some, 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 some thoughts, some things that you, we, we could do to really, here's what I want to try to say, to make the most out of Christmas, to get the, the, the absolute best out of it rather than wasting uh, so much of it. And so if you're writing notes, I want you to write some of these down. If you're not writing notes this morning, join us and start writing notes, okay? Number one, how do we get the most out of Christmas? Number one, you calculate it. What does that mean? To calculate something means that you, 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 you need to bring all of the parts together and begin to examine them. They are all important. Jeremiah 29, 13 says, And you will seek me and find me when you search for me with all of your heart. In verse 15, it says that when these, these angels had appeared or they had gone away into heaven, immediately these shepherds says, Let's, we got to go check this out. We've got to go see if these things actually are so. We must go. It demanded something of them. 
And so they took off seeking uh, this Savior. Now the beauty of this, the real beauty of Christmas is that God is seeking us. You, you may not be aware of that this morning and thinking, man, I'm only here because of my mom. Said, I got it's Christmas, I got to go. But the reality of it is, it's not your mom, it's Jesus. Jesus is seeking you. Matter of fact, the Bible says that our salvation, that nobody comes to God unless the Spirit of God draw him to them. What's beauty, the beauty of all this is that he'd sent an angel to bring these shepherds, he sent a star to bring the wise men, and now he sends his Spirit to bring us. To him, so we must calculate it. We must see all of the parts as necessary. The second thing we are called to do is we are called to contemplate it. That's a big word for a hillbilly preacher, isn't it? To contemplate something. That means to focus in on something. That means to give consideration to it. We see in verses 17 down through 19, it says, And when they had seen him, they made widely known this saying, which was told them concerning this child. And, and those who heard it, they marveled at all those things which were told them by the shepherds. They were absolutely filled with wonder and amazement at what they were seeing. And by the way, wouldn't you? You're out in the middle one night just hanging out with the guys, watching over your flock, and all of a sudden an angel shows up. Here again, I think we're too familiar with the text to be any more in wonder with it. I, I'm telling you, they may have had some guys pass out. Y'all see if you can get Jed up. He don't want to miss this. Hey, hey, go over, go over and see if you can get that guy. Hey, don't miss this. Why? Man, an angel standing here speaking. I'm, I'm sure y'all get that most weeks, right? I, I can't even begin to imagine what, 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 how awestruck these men were whenever they begin to, to now think through what had just happened. Have you ever had a moment like that in your life? It was so life altering. It was such a, a big moment that when it's done, you're sitting there going, "What was that?" How, how, how in the world could that have possibly happened? The Bible says that Mary, she, she took all these things and she pondered them in her heart. I studied that word this week. I'm sure you're impressed with that. It comes from a Greek compound, a compound Greek word. That, 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 and I won't fill you or bore you with all the details of that. But the first is a verb that means to throw. The second word that follows is the word together. What it literally means is, is that when Mary was pondering these things in her heart, it meant that she threw all these things together. And so here's how I'd illustrate it because this is kind of near to my heart. I had a guy tell me this week that I like cake too much. I didn't know that I did. And I started describing things that I eat. I eat for breakfast, I eat muffins. Well, that's cake. Did you know that? And well, what do you eat with beans? I eat cornbread. Jiffy corn, like God's cornbread. That's cake. Well, I've learned some things about cake. Number one, supposedly it's not good for you. Feels good. But it takes a lot of ingredients. Now, it's important that these ingredients that you follow the, the, the kind of the, what's that thing called? Thank you, the recipe. Because it, some things look alike, but they are not alike. Salt and sugar look alike. You change them, it'll wean you from liking cake, amen? Isn't that right? So, so, so ingredients are important. It's important that things are factual, that they are true, that they're in their place. Now take that same mentality, and the Bible is saying that Mary threw all of these things together. Well, what things? Prophecy? You see, the story of the manger doesn't mean a lot unless it's linked to prophecy. All the way back in the early chapters of Genesis, you hear about this, this seed of woman. And in Micah, we read about this promised Messiah that would be born in Bethlehem. Isaiah, he, he foretells of a virgin that will conceive and, and, and bear a son. The government will be upon his shoulders. Mighty God. Wonderful counselor, prince of peace. Now Mary takes this and she, she remembers this angel's message to her that you're going to give birth to a son. Oh yeah, before you know a man. And the Bible says she throws this together and she begins to ponder on this. And when we ponder on these things also, we consider them or we contemplate them, it, it changes Christmas for us. It changes the story. It's not just a nostalgic, let's go home and eat some tater candy, which I challenge all of you to go home and do. 
But it's a picture of the fact that because this baby boy came, he's changed not only our life here, he's changed our eternity. It's important to do this about Christmas so that we don't get caught up in what I see so many Christians getting caught up in today. We talked about this in our small group this morning, and boy, it just seemed like every year I'm more disturbed by what has really robbed joy from Christians during Christmas. Some of us can't really enjoy it anymore because somebody said Xmas rather than Christmas. And matter of fact, I'll just give you a little bit of homework. Go read the, the origins. I mean, I'm not promoting you you use Xmas rather than Christmas, but go read the origins of that. The origins of Xmas was not about cutting Christ out. It was a picture of the, the, the X stood for a Greek word, which uh, talked about Christ the Lord. But because of that, in our culture, we see that as cutting Christ out. We, man, we're just mad. We'll go to the mall, and we're, somebody said, Xmas. I'll not shop there, and I'll put it on Facebook four times a day. Somebody will say happy holidays to us. Immediately we're burned up. And I understand that there's an attack on our, our faith and our culture. I, I totally get that. I'm, and I'm certainly not telling you to, to water it down, to weaken it down. But if we'd spend more time doing as Mary did, to throwing all these things together, to contemplate them, to focus our attention on these things, there is nothing that can rob our joy. There is nothing that can, can take that away from us. Why? Because it is only one man, the God man, who gave it to us. Thirdly, I want to encourage you not only to just to, to calculate it and contemplate it, but when we put those things together, our hearts become full and we begin to celebrate. That's why this is such a, a glorious time of year. Have you noticed how just infectious Christmas is? Literally even around the world, Christmas has become this, this atmospheric change. The Bible says the shepherds, when they returned, they were glorifying and praising God for all the things that they had heard and seen as it was told them. I've wondered what that looked like. I wonder if it looked Baptist or Pentecostal. If it were Baptist, probably one of the shepherds says, you sing the first verse, I'll sing the third. If it were Pentecostal, they probably danced a little bit of a jig on the way back to the field. I wonder what it looked like. Here's what I do know. These men went back different than they came. These men went back filled with wonder and amazement. And the Bible says that they went back glorifying and praising God for all of the things that they had heard and seen. Let me give you the last one we'll be done. Lastly, as we see as an example of these shepherds, is they circulated it. What does that mean? Look in verse 17. Verse 17, I'm going to backtrack this a little bit. Verse 17, the Bible says in, in chapter 2, says, Now when they had seen him, they made widely known the saying which was told them concerning this child. These shepherds became the very first witnesses of this historic event. And I am in my, my estimation thinking, well, man, the nobles would have been a better shot. Uh, so get somebody with some wealth, somebody that has the, the resources to do this, and yet he finds the, the, the lowly, the outcast, those who really had no standing in society, and he says, I want you to be first. So these shepherds began to circulate it everywhere that they went. Their eyes had seen God in flesh. Their eyes had looked upon the one whom the prophets had foretold for centuries. They heard the music and the musicians of heaven. And yet, many of us just look at that as, well, that was a nativity kind of world. What? A nativity kind of world. I think sometimes we do that. You've seen the nativity scenes. My, my bride, she loves these, and I try to get them wherever I go. She's got a lot of different ones. I think sometimes we think of Christmas like that. It's just, it was a nativity kind of world. Everybody, it was Christmas time. The baby is, everybody loves a baby. It brings and it changes life, right? I bet everybody just wanted to hug everybody back then. I bet everybody just was saying, hey, come over to the house. We'll have eggnog together and celebrate the birth of the king. But no, the absolute opposite is true. It was a day of oppression. It was a day of, in which the government was corrupt. Sir, sure glad we've got that fixed, amen. 
It, it was a day in which that there was great division among the classes of people. It was a day in which God and the prophets had been silent for 400 years. And now hope is born. Now hope in the midst of corruption. And yet 33 years later, just eight miles away on Mount Zion, his last evening he declared to his disciples, I am the way, I am the truth and the life, and no one comes to the Father except through me. Their world is just like ours, filled with corruption, conflict, confusion, controversy. I say that because Jesus was the answer to it all. He still is. He's the one that brings absolutes into our confusion and questions. It's interesting that he chose who he chose to do it. Well, guess what? We're just like him. We aren't the nobles of our society. We are not the upper echelons of our society. We are the shepherds of our society. We are the ones that now in our society look down and say, I really don't want to hear what you have to say. We are the ones that our society looks upon now. In the moment that we begin to speak, we are discounted simply because of the name in which we ascribe ourselves to, Christian. And yet God gives to us the greatest message, the greatest story that could ever be told. And he says, tell it abroad. It is Christ who is born and brings joy and hope and peace. So here's my commission to you. Come home for Christmas. What does it mean, preacher? How, do, how, how does that happen? Where does the journey begin? How do you really make the most out of this Christmas? Well, we see it in the shepherds. You calculate it. It's what the shepherds did. Check it out. Add it up. Look at all the pieces. Contemplated. They marveled, were amazed. Mary pondered it in her heart and then celebrate it. Don't be one of those prudes. Don't spend more time griping about buying gifts with money you don't have for people you don't like at events you don't want to attend. Celebrate it. You see, when you've contemplated this incredible message, this Messiah, the, the best way to give glory to God is to return your life to Him in celebration. And once you do it, you can't help but to speak the things that you've seen and heard and through this you circulate it. I need something, just confess, that never changes. Sure, I look back on those days of sloppy joes, and I kind of miss them. I do. I look forward to seeing my grandma in heaven. I don't miss the cigarettes. But I miss, I miss those days of sloppy joes. I miss those times of my family getting together. But it's all changed. We're trying something new even this year. And it'll feel awkward. You know how that is. You start something new that was kind of supposed to be like what it used to be. And it's, it's awkward. I need something that's solid in my life. What I'm offering to you this morning is just that. There is a home in Jesus that never changes. When it comes to this time of Christmas, though, you may go somewhere different this year or next year. You may not get sloppy joes. You may be a backslidden individual and eat hamburgers. But the reality is Jesus is saying to you, here's his invitation, come home. Come home for Christmas. Come to me. I am the one who never changes. I am constant. I change not.